Welcome to the Legally Speaking Podcast. I'm your host, Rob Hanna. I'm delighted to bring you all the Fertility in the Workplace mini-series. This mini-series delves into how fertility in the workplace can be addressed more openly and how law firms can do a better job at acknowledging the challenges faced all around fertility. The series looks into tackling fertility issues as a lawyer, in addition to family planning and becoming parents. This week, we're going to delve into fertility at work coaching and how it can help you with not only your fertility, but also how to juggle work at the same time. And we have the pleasure of being joined by a very special guest, Emma Menzies. Emma is a coach and neuro-linguistic programming practitioner. Previously, Emma worked as an employment lawyer, Evershed Sutherland and Marks and Spencers. Emma's personal and professional background lends her focus on fertility at work. Emma assists clients to develop a clear sense of purpose, balance priorities and regain control of their career. Ultimately, Emma encourages the idea of women having a career which complements the pursuit of motherhood and family. So a very warm welcome, Emma. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's really great to be here. Um, I am a coach. I'm formerly an employment lawyer and also fertility patient. And I help people to manage the impact that their fertility challenges are having on their career and their working life. And I also work with organisations to help them to manage fertility in the workplace and support their employees who are dealing with fertility issues. And thank you so much once again. And, you know, you do such amazing work. You know, let's learn a little bit more about your journey. How did you get into this? Like I said earlier, I was um, an employment lawyer previously, and it was while I was working in this capacity for Marks & Spencer that my own fertility journey started. And... All the lawyers out there know how demanding that career can be. There can be a lot of pressure, a lot of expectation on your shoulders, a lot of demands. And it was full time. And I was doing that alongside my fertility journey. And I found it really difficult to to manage the two. The fertility journey itself is very all consuming and felt like another full time job. And you know, logistically, practically, it was really difficult when I had lots of appointments, lots of places to be and things to do, taking medications and so on. And mentally and emotionally, it was really a a struggle as well. And I found that there'd be times when I was really holding back in my career. And then, you know, when things weren't going anywhere with the fertility stuff, I'd feel very much in limbo and be getting very frustrated. And there'd be times when I'd be pushing forward in my career and then I'd be worrying that I was jeopardizing my fertility or you know not giving that enough time and attention so there was always this feeling of conflict like I wasn't doing any of these things that were important to me well enough and that I was failing at both of these things as well and I increasingly just um, became more anxious, um, more withdrawn, more lacking in confidence, always worrying about what other people were thinking, always um, feeling like I wasn't doing good enough, doing anything well enough. Um, I was worried about my future prospects, both on the fertility journey and in my career. I was, um, you know, increasingly crying in the loos, if I could even make it to the loos before I'd be in tears. And it was a real, a real struggle. And after six years of this, I eventually burned out. And it was then sort of with some distance and looking back on that, that I saw as Uh, as somebody who'd been through this, that there was a gap in support, not just in my organisation, but everywhere. And as an employment lawyer as well, I saw there was a gap in the the support. As an employment lawyer, in over 13 years of practice, I hadn't been advising on this issue. And I knew by this stage that it wasn't because it wasn't going on. I knew, knew the stats. I knew it was one in six couples. I knew it was one in four pregnancies ending in miscarriage. I knew it was the LGBTQ community, the people who are single, who are having all of these struggles as well. So it was a bit of a kind of um, a light bulb moment for me at one stage where I just realized here's this gap. And I have this experience of the workplace from employment law background. I have all of this personal experience. And now I, at this stage, I had coaching qualifications as well. And I just thought I could bring this all together. And I really want to bring this all together to be able to help other people and help other people who are struggling the way that I had done and help them to be able to be happy and healthy and fulfilled on their journey and really plug that gap where fertility and work come together. 
Yeah, and, and thank you so much for, for sharing so so openly with us there, because I know this is going to help so many people out there listening in today. And you touched on coaching. I want to sort of drill on that specifically. How does that help? Well, to talk about how it helps, I probably need to talk about why maybe in the first place we can find ourselves suffering in the way that I did and the way I commonly see my, my clients do. And there's a distinction there to be made between what I'm calling suffering and what I'm going to call pain, because, you know, obviously I don't know why people are on their fertility journey. And there's a whole host of pain and trauma that can come with that, with the diagnoses, the the losses, all of the disappointments. And that's that's not for coaching. And that's not what I'm talking about here. But what I'm talking about in suffering is what happens next it's when we respond to that and it's when we find ourselves in the stuck and struggling to states that I was just talking about because behind that generally there is a a set of thoughts uh, the stories we tell ourselves a certain narrative and meaning that we give to things that is shaped by our values our beliefs our attitudes our experiences our, our memories all of the things that make us who we are that we've got from our family, friend, communities, cultures, religions, and so on. And these thoughts then make us feel a certain way, which make us behave a certain way, which make us experience life in a certain way. And all of this isn't our fault. It happens on autopilot. It's it's part of our conditioning. It's um, habitual. But to give you an example of, of that in practice, if you were somebody who, for example, believed that you would be a burden to your organisation, to your manager, to your team, if you were to have IVF, and your line manager said to you, I've ranged cover uh, for a week while you're having fertility treatment, you might then think, oh, they, they, they don't value any me anymore. They're going to replace me. They don't want me. Um, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not worth worthy of this. I'm, I'm, I'm taking up their resources. And that might create feelings of, of guilt, of worry of lack of worth of um, insecurity that may make you behave in certain ways like for example saying oh don't worry you don't need to cover I'll do it or pushing extra hard to prove yourself and again as I say this isn't our fault it's something that happens quite habitually but where coaching comes in one thing that coaching can really help with is to spot those patterns those habitual ways of thinking and operating to draw awareness to the set of thoughts that kick starts all of this and challenge it and explore it and therefore open up new perspectives and different choices so that you can feel differently behave differently and therefore experience life differently so to go back to that example it could be that with a bit of coaching around whether those beliefs are really true and what else um, certain situations might mean you might find yourself thinking my a good employer a good line manager would support me to manage my work in conjunction with my life priorities so that when the line manager says I've got cover for you for a week while you have IVF you feel supported you feel um, relief and then perhaps the, the behaviour is to graciously accept that support and, and, and um, therefore the, the experience is one that's very different. And you can do that yourself. It, it sounds very straightforward, but it, it isn't easy. It's a skill and you can work on it. And I share tools with my clients to, to help them work on it themselves. And if anyone's listening to this thinking that would be useful for them, I'm really happy to share that with them you, you can um go to my website readystudycoach.com and drop me an email and i'll send that to you but it only takes you so far which is why coaches always have their own coaches as well um it, you know having that support to to raise your awareness and help you explore these patterns is a really useful um way of getting out of these stuck states that we do find ourselves so i would say that's a big way that coaching helps but it it goes beyond that as well to um really getting rid of all of the shoulds musts oughts that we have in life and coming back to ourselves and what it is what that we really want what it is that we really need what works well for us what doesn't so that you can find your track and you can find your strategies for keeping you on track and you can have the comfort 
confidence and the courage to take action. And all the while you have your coach there as your cheerleader, as the person for accountability and as the sounding board. And it becomes really powerful, these conversations to move you forward. And that's really, for me, what gets you out of stuck in struggling in the way that I was to to really um, uh, being able to live a life that's happy and fulfilled and regaining control of both your career and your fertility journey and how they're working together. Yeah. And again, thank you so much for, for giving so much context around the, the benefits of coaching and, and how it can help. And again, some, some of your journey there. I just wanted to drill down again, more specifically related to coaches. And I love that you brought up the fact that, you know, coaches should have coaches themselves. But how does, you know, your fertility at work coaching differ from other fertility or career coaching that might be out there? Yeah, so um, fertility coaching, um, certainly in my experience, is a lot more geared towards um, this goal of becoming a parent and supporting you through the processes that you might be engaged in to get you to that point of being a parent. Um, Career coaching and, you know, outside of my specialism of fertility at work, I do career and executive coaching as well. And Obviously, that's geared around careers, but you can't look at a career without looking at other aspects of life as well and how they work together. But fertility is such a big topic on its own and it's really complex and requires, I I think, more sort of knowledge and expertise than might normally sit within a career coaching on its own. So fertility at work coaching really falls between the two or at least draws on the two. I think it, it draws together an expertise from fertility and from um career and it's it's not so much about get the baby or get the career it's about making these two worlds work together in a way that works for you and the focus being on actually just being happy now being healthy now and being fulfilled now yeah, no, really, really well said. And thanks so much for, for highlighting those those differences there. And I guess sticking with some some differences, how does it differ from other perhaps holistic support that might be available and out there? Well, I mentioned earlier that there was this difference between what I was calling pain and trauma and, um, and suffering. And I said, you know, coaching isn't for the pain and the trauma. And I, I think for that and that does require grieving and it does require healing you want to be looking more towards other therapists um counselors psychotherapists hypnotherapists um you know coaching isn't a therapy it can feel very therapeutic but it isn't a therapy and it's also very forward looking um i talk about coaching like driving a car where you want to be somewhere and most of the time you're looking out that front window to get there but occasionally you glance back out the back window and to the sides out the rear windows to pick up information to help you go forward whereas with some of these other therapies you can spend more time looking back to why you ended up where you are which is not what you do in coaching so that's a key difference and you may also come across mentors quite a bit in careers in particular where you have people telling you I did this try this do that hints and tips based on somebody's own experiences but um, with with coaching it's a lot more drawing out from you what is right for you rather than doing what somebody else has done it assumes that what works for one person doesn't always work for another so they are all valid support it's really about finding finding what's right for you and actually on that point I do come across um regularly and I made these mistakes myself two big mistakes that people tend to make one is not asking for help at all and the other is doing too much and trying to do everything and of course trying to do it all perfectly but on the not asking for help side of things you know I commonly see people on the fertility journey investing a whole, whole lot of resources, money and time on the, the fertility clinics and they're trying to get pregnant, which I'm not knocking because I absolutely do that myself as well. But then there's all these narratives and these stories that we have about then investing in ourselves, you know, like um, it's selfish or it's indulgent to invest in ourselves or I don't have the money to invest in myself or, um, you know, I've got to keep the money for the fertility treatment and all of this going on when actually we are the vessel for this baby we're trying to bring into the world or with a and or with a parent um the future parent and I, I my personal experience is definitely that when I've used these other um ways of investing myself these are the ways of getting my help more help I've ended up 
a better person living a better life. It's been fantastic. It's been worth the investment, even if it hasn't necessarily meant becoming a, a mother yet. It's certainly been a great uh, investment. So I think sort of, you know, do a bit of coaching there to challenge the stories you might be telling yourself around um, getting help and maybe you think it's a sign of weakness and so on. But I really do sort of encourage that. But then not flipping into this other thing, which is trying to do everything, because I do think it can get quite overwhelming on a fertility journey as well, where you hear all of this, you, sh- you should do this, you should do that, try the coaching, try the counselling, try the acupuncture, the reflexology and all of these things. And it's quite easy to fall into the trap of, of the stories. Again, the things that we tell ourselves around, I have to do everything and I have to do it all really well to be just deserving of this baby I'm trying to make or to, to know that I've done everything to, to be to get it and then we just burn ourselves up trying to tick everything off the to-do list and it's much better I think again to apply a little bit of a, a coaching there to think about what works for you and what feels right for you and see it more of a bit of a buffet table of um, options and pick the ones that look appealing and then go back for seconds if they're great and don't go back if they're not so good and approach it in that way but absolutely do seek these other ways of getting support but be very balanced about it as well and pro- approach it with the a kind of energy of, of well-being and doing good rather than oh it's another thing that I have to cross off my to-do list to be perfect. Yeah, and I think there's some really, really good advice there. And, you know, particularly, you know, perhaps people not wanting to to ask for help or, or keeping things bottled up, or as you say, then going the other way and, and doing too much and then the overwhelm kicks in. So this has been fantastic, Emma. Really enjoyed learning. And thank you so much for being so open and sharing your journey and all the work that you're doing to help people in this space, particularly, you know, off the back of tough times through, through the pandemic and so forth. The more you can help people and get this message out there, the better. Um, on that, I know you touched on your website a little bit earlier but if people are interested or want to get in touch with you for more information what's the best way for them to do that feel free to re-mention your website and any social media handles and we'll share this with this particular episode too um yes you can contact me via my website readystudycoach.com and also the the other best place to find me is on linkedin my handles emma menzies so do connect with me there as well that would be great Fabulous. Well, thank you so much once again for for featuring today, Emma. We really, really appreciate it from all of us on the Legally Speaking podcast. Over and out. This week's review comes from Max1998. He says, excellent podcast. What a podcast. Very educational and informative. Such an easy podcast to listen to along the way. Keep up the content and keep it coming. Thank you so, so much, Max. We really appreciate your kind words from all of us on the Legally Speaking podcast. Thanks a million.